Welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism. This is Jay. In this conversation, we talk to Ziad El Nabolsi about two of his recent pieces on Marxism Leninism in the East African context. One piece is entitled Lenin in East Africa, Abdul Rahman Muhammad Babu, and Danny Wadada Nabuderi. From The Future of Lenin, Power, Politics, and Revolution in the 21st Century. And the other is Questions from the Dar es Salaam Debates, which folks can find in the book Revolutionary Movements in Africa, An Untold Story, which was recently published by Pluto Press. I do recommend the edited collections these come from, and we will link both of them in the show notes. Ziad El Nabolsi is an assistant professor at York University. He has written extensively on African philosophy, and we hope to have many more conversations with him in the future. I will note as a caveat again for our audience that this is one of the conversations we recorded prior to October 7th. So if it feels like Palestine or the Congo or Haiti or Sudan or even more discussion on Fanon might have been meaningful for us to engage in this conversation given recent events, there's a reason that we did not and a reason that the context that we discuss in passing are the anti-colonial coup d'etats in West Africa, given that this conversation was recorded towards the end of the summer. Ziad has done some really interesting work on Edward Said and some work on Western philosophy and Islam, so hopefully we can have another conversation with him soon that is able to weave together some of the current events with his historical and philosophical research interests. Nonetheless, this is a very interesting discussion and highlights some East African Marxists that we should be much more familiar with given the importance of their thought and political formulations, but who are often not well known outside of the circles who are more knowledgeable about African Marxism or African Marxism, Leninism in particular. In this discussion, of course, we do talk about East African Marxism, Leninism, Pan Africanism, African socialism, as embodied by folks like Julius Nereri and his concept of Ujama, and the famous Dar es Salaam debates. We also talk about Nabuderi's work on imperialism, taking Lenin's theory of imperialism and updating and applying it to the African context. There is much more to say, but we'll leave that for the conversation itself. We will also provide a link where folks can check out all of the articles that Ziad al Nambulsi has published on his Phil Paper site. As always, to support our work, become a patron of the show. It's the best way you can ensure that we are able to continue bringing you these live streams, which we try to do multiple times each week on our YouTube page, and that we're able to bring you podcast episodes like this one. And of course, our study groups as well. You can support that work at patreon.com slash millennials are killing capitalism for as little as a dollar a month. Welcome to the show. Before we delve into this, I'm sure a number of our listeners are familiar with their work, but I'm also sure that many are not. So could you just introduce yourself briefly to our audience and say a little bit about your research, including the two essays we'll be talking about with you today? Uh, of course, thank you very much for uh, having me on the podcast. So my name is Ziad Nabolsi. I am an assistant professor of philosophy at York University in Toronto. My research is primarily on African intellectual history with a focus on the history of African philosophy and a special interest in the history of the reception of Marxism on the African continent. So on the two essays we'll be talking about today are part of my work on the reception of Marxism in East Africa specifically. I also have interests in Marxism in uh, Guinea-Bissau and so on, but today we're primarily looking at Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya. Awesome. Thank you. So, you know, there's a number of figures we'll be discussing today. One essay kind of that we'll talk about a little bit later deals with a set of debates that include a number of folks at, at Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. But the first piece deals primarily with a couple figures. So I thought it'd be helpful just to to say a little bit about them to open up. The piece we're talking about first is called Lenin and East African Marxism. And you highlight a couple of East African Marxists in particular in this piece, Danny Nabuderi and Abdul Rahman Muhammad Babu. We like very briefly touched on Nabuderi in our discussion with Louis Alde when we talked about his work at Liberated Texts, which I know you've, you've contributed to that as well. And I think we spoke a little bit about one of your essays, maybe about Kareem Hergy, maybe in that context? or Yes, um, yes. 
Yes. Yeah. But that was like really cursory. And so we really didn't get a chance to go into any detail there either. So it it would be great if you could just share a little bit about who these two figures were and maybe some of the things that that drew you to them as you as you started to work on this essay. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, So let me just give a kind of brief biographical overview of the two figures. So Abdurrahman Muhammad Babu was born in 1924. He passed away in 1996. So he was born and he grew up in Zanzibar, an island off the main coast, which was historically kind of subordinate to the Sultanate of Amman. But then uh, the ruling family moved there and it was initially independent of the mainland of Tanganyika. But then unification happened almost as soon as as the Zanzibari revolution happened as a kind of response to that. I mean, we can go into the detail. But anyway, so he grew up in this context and he was involved in the anti-colonial movement. And in 1964, he even attained the position of foreign minister in the government of Abid Kurame, which was formed directly after the Zanzibari revolution. And so to, to give just a brief account of that revolution, um, the Zanzibari population was divided between Arabs and Africans. Of course, there is a caveat here in terms of the racial labeling, but historically it was a sort of slave society based on the cultivation of cloves for export. So of course, there were a lot of racial tensions and we'll see the importance that Babo attributes to racial identity in the way he thinks about Marxism. We can talk about this later, but it comes really from this context, of course. So his work as a foreign minister involved really trying to develop alliances with socialist countries. And there was an attempt to neutralize this. And the U.S. was worried that Zanzibar would turn into what they called an African Cuba, because, of course, this is in the context of the Cuban revolution and its aftermath and the increasing radicalization of the Cuban government and so on. So they're really worried about this. And so in response to that, they engineered the kind of unification between Zanzibar and Tanganyika in uh, April of 1964. Now, of course, in Tanganyika, the ruling party was TANU, the Tanganyika National Union, headed by Julius Nyerere. And Babu took a critical approach towards Nyerere's African socialism. This eventually led him to being imprisoned by Nyerere. So he was just imprisoned from 1972 to 78. And after his release, he he actually leaves Tanzania. He goes to the United States. And then in 84, he moves to London. And during his exile, he really kind of continued to stay in touch with radical activists on the continent and from the diaspora. He was particularly supportive to Eritrean independence movements, serving as a kind of advisor. And he was contributing to journals like the Journal of African Marxists, a review of African political economy, which is still around, of course and the Africa World Review. So he remained active both as a kind of advisor and as a theoretician. Now, with respect to Nabuderi, Nabuderi is a bit younger than Babu. So Nabuderi is born in 1932, and he dies in 2011. And Nabuderi is quite well known as a figure in African Marxism, but he's not really that well known outside the circle of people who are involved in things such as the Dar es Salaam debate. So as a young student, he was active in the Ugandan struggle against British colonialism. As a member of the executive committee of the United Kingdom Uganda Students Association, and he was also a member of the youth wing of the Uganda People's Congress. Although, again, we'll see here there are some tensions between these nationalist movements and Marxists like Nabodari, because he was expelled and accused of organizing a communist plot, and then he's subjected to arrest in 1969. He would later be released and he would actually very interestingly work for Idi Amin's government, but he became disenchanted. And in 1972, he went to Dar es Salaam, where of course he participated in the debates that you mentioned, the Dar es Salaam debates. He he would also go on to play an important role in the founding of the Uganda National Liberation Front, which came into power in April 1979. And after its overthrow in 1980, the Uganda National Liberation Front, which was renamed the Uganda National Liberation Front Anti-Dictatorship, between parentheses, it launched a brief armed struggle. Again, Nabudari is involved in that. But again, he would eventually leave to teach in Denmark in 1982, where he continued writing works on Marxist political economy. He would return to Uganda in the 1990s, and he founded the Marcus Garvey Pan-African Institute. So actually, something interesting to note about Nabudari is His works from the period we'll be discussing in the 1970s and 1980s, 
he's not that interested in Pan-Africanism. But in the 1990s, he's very much turning towards Pan-Africanism. And he actually kind of moves away a bit from his earlier Marxist positions, which happened, of course, with a lot of intellectuals in the 1990s. So, so that's kind of a brief biographical overview of who these people were. Perfect. Thank you. So in, in particular, you look at Lambadari's work in the political economy of imperialism. You write, the re- rediscovery of imperialism by the Western left should be accompanied by the rediscovery of the theories of imperialism that were developed by the third world Marxists. So can you talk about some of the more important insights from Lambadari's work on imperialism that would be useful for the Western left or Marxists more broadly to grapple with and ultimately utilize to better understand the world today? Yeah, of course, that's a great question. So one way to think about Nabuderi's work is as a response to some of the objections that were raised with respect to Lenin's theory of imperialism. You know, he's writing almost half a century after the publication of Lenin's book on imperialism. And among the the objections that were raised to Lenin's theory of imperialism, was the idea that Lenin overstated the importance of overseas investment to the accumulation of capital in the imperialist centers, so in the kind of core countries like the United States, of course, parts of Western Europe, Japan to to an extent. Although still, I mean, Nabodari is writing in the 1970s, so the status of Japan is, is becoming clearer, but it's not as clear as it would be in the 1980s and 1990s. So people have said, well, look, Lenin, actually overestimates the extent to which the colonies, or in Nabodari's context, the neo-colonies, so again, he's talking after independence, played an important role for the economy of countries in the imperialist center. And they would point to the fact that the major part of the direct investments of these major capitalist countries takes place amongst themselves, and not amongst them and, say, a place like Tanzania or a place like Guatemala, for instance. So Nabodera's response is very interesting because he says, look, you can't just look at this purely quantitatively. And what does he mean by this? So it could be that, for example, only 5% of your overseas capital goes towards countries in the global south. But again, it depends on what this capital is doing, really. You have to kind of do a concrete analysis because it could be the case that profitable investment in the imperialist countries amongst themselves is dependent on investments in the third world new colonies, if you like, since production in the center could be dependent on raw materials from these countries. So it could be that, for example, you only export 5% of uh, the capital that you invest overseas to a place like Niger, but there are very valuable minerals that you need for global production processes. So again, the importance wouldn't just be pointed out by the size of the fraction, as it were, or the percentage. You actually have to engage in concrete investigation. So Abu Dari points out that it's not just a matter of the value of capital exports, because other factors, like we were saying, come into consideration. So, for example, the potential future use of resources and cutting off your other competitors from supplies of raw materials. And again, what's interesting is that this objection, which I mentioned earlier, keeps getting raised today, but nobody's taking into consideration that Nabodari attempted to respond to this objection. Of course, we can have a debate about the extent to which it's a reasonable response or not, but it's not even on the table in terms of the people who are talking quite a bit about this today. The other thing that Nabodari develops based on Lenin's theory of imperialism is that he takes the view that while racism was, of course, a factor in the scramble for Africa, which took place in the late 19th century up to, say, the period of the beginning of World War I, while it is an important factor, one shouldn't attempt to explain imperialism solely or primarily in terms of racism. Instead, one should understand it primarily in terms of the economic requirements of monopoly capitalists. Even if one must recognize that, of course, racism informed the manner in which control over African resources was exerted, namely through direct colonial coercion. But again, this point is very important. Uh, In Nabudari's context, he really wanted to make this point because he thought that after independence, the ruling parties in many places were trying to depict it as purely a racial struggle. But of course, if it's purely a racial struggle, then questions of internal oppression might get bracketed and so on. So these are uh, some of the elements that I think are important in Nabudari's theory of imperialism. Yeah, that's great. So just to bring this to kind of a current context to some degree for folks to this discussion, and you you talk about this in the essay, you specifically talk about the role of France 
in, quote, Central African Republic, Mali, Chad, Niger, Benin, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, and Togo, end quote. And, you know, since you, you, you look at this since the 1960s, and obviously it's something that's on the mind of folks recently, especially with some of the recent events in Mali, Niger, and uh, Burkina Faso in recent years, and even, you know, especially with in the last month. So what are some of the specific features of French imperialism among these African states that Nabuderi's work helps us to kind of examine and attend to? Yeah, so again, that's a very pertinent question given given what's happening today. So Nabuderi doesn't specifically look at Francophone West Africa, if we want to use that expression, but we can extrapolate. Because one of the things that Nabuderi wants to emphasize is the idea that imperialism doesn't require direct political control in the sense of, you know, you have to go there and set up a colonial administration and so on. But of course, when the structures that ensure value drain from these new colonies is threatened, then coercion is very much on the agenda. So if you look at sort of the five features of imperialism, and it's kind of like a cluster of properties, which Nabodari again picks up from Lenin, so the creation of monopolies, the merging of bank capital with industrial capital, giving birth to finance capital. The third one is the increased importance of the exporting of capital as opposed to the exporting of commodities. The fourth one being, you know, the formation of international associations, which kind of divide the world amongst themselves. And the fifth one is, of course, territorial division of essentially the entire world, that there is nothing left outside as a word. So if you look at these five features, you don't really need direct colonial administrative control for them to obtain. So one way to think about this is that imperialism is kind of a general type of which colonialism is a very specific type. And again, new colonialism is another specific type of this more general type of imperialism. Now looking at Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, well, the obvious sense in which imperialism is still very much in place, even though there is no direct colonial course of rule, is of course monetary policy. So the SEFA system, so the SEFA is overvalued at spec to the euro. This makes French goods relatively cheaper to, to markets in, in West Africa. And it also means that the products of these countries in the SEFA zone are more expensive. Now, also given that the SEFA is spec to the euro, this means that it fluctuates based on monetary policies that are pursued in the European centers. Again, monetary policies which might not reflect the best interests of West African countries. And all of this is in place without direct colonial rule. But of course, when the SEFA system is threatened, then coercion is very much on the agenda. And, you know, the, the two most famous examples are the assassination of Silvanus Olympio of Togo in 1963 and Thomas Sankara of Burkina Faso in 1987. So again, it's a kind of dialectic between these existing structures, which ensure the exploitation of these countries, and which does not really require direct coercion. But when it's threatened, then, you know, military intervention is definitely on the agenda. I mean, the, the other thing I'll say is, of course, if people want to learn more about this, then I direct them to the work of Ndongo Sila, who uh, I don't know if you guys have interviewed him, but but he does incredible work on the stuff. And his book, Africa's Last Colonial Currency, goes into a lot of detail with res- respect to the SEFA system. Uh, so that's uh, just I wanted to uh, give a shout out to that. We haven't interviewed him yet, but it's been on my mind, especially with the recent stuff. I think we should. So, yeah. Yeah, he's great. He really is. So now, as we mentioned, you also examine in this particular essay, uh, Lenin and East African Marxism, the work of Abdul Rahman Muhammad Babu. So he also helps us to to better understand neocolonialism. Specifically, you note that for Babu, the right to self-determination insofar as it requires more than the attainment of juridical sovereignty requires the transformation of the economic structures of the formerly colonized countries. Babu emphasizes this point when he notes that there can be no solution to the problem of underdevelopment by way of shifting trading partners, i.e. trading with the socialist bloc, without transforming the internal structure of the inherited colonial economies, end quote. So, If you would, just say a little bit about Babu's theoretical developments here based on what he was analyzing in the East African uh, context. 
Yeah, of course. Again, that's that's a really important question because, of course, Abdurrahman Muhammad Babu, he was, of course, a socialist. He was in support of the socialist bloc. Although, of course, this gets complicated with the Sino-Soviet split and so on, but we don't need to get into that. But it's very interesting that he's not naive at all about what would happen if, say, Tanzania would get a better deal for its raw materials from the socialist bloc, because frequently that was the case. And he wasn't, of course, opposed to that, but he understood that there were limitations to that, because even if you were, let's say, to get better prices for your raw materials, that wouldn't really lead to a restructuring of your economy. You'd still have an economy that's based on the export of, say, primary agricultural goods, and there is no integration with whatever industrial sector you have in that economy. It's now that you're just getting better prices, but again, that's a very precarious position because things could happen. Of course, Cuba experienced that, for example, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was giving it preferential prices for its sugar and so on. So he's really thinking in this holistic long-term way about economic planning. And he was thinking that, well, if you do get better trade deals with the German Democratic Republic, the Soviet Union and China, uh, what you could do is try to insist on some kind of technology transfer, use accumulated capital from the export of primary goods to build up your industrial sector, to train technically proficient workers and, and a technically uh, proficient managerial group and so on. So again, there is this holistic approach. He's not naive at all because sometimes people characterize people like Babu as having been naive about the possibilities that were on the table as it were. Uh, during the Cold War. So again, I think that's that's not true at all. And he's also really interested, I think, in creating regional, uh, in thinking about regional blocks and thinking about the possibility of inter-African trade, because that's something that, in terms of the colonial legacy, trade between African countries and between especially internal parts of the African continent that aren't on the coast was tremendously underdeveloped. And I'm sure you've seen some of these maps about railway lines on the African continent during the colonial period. They all go sort of from the interior to these port areas, but there is no sort of a vertical connection. So you have all of these horizontal parallel lines, as it were, without any vertical connection between them. So he's really thinking about the legacy of colonialism and how to overcome it. And how to take advantage of any opportunities that arise in terms of the global configuration, because, of course, during that period, there was the possibility of playing off the different blocks so as to get a better deal and so on, which would, of course, these opportunities would be undermined after the collapse of the Soviet Union when uh, a so-called unipolar world emerged. So he's thinking about all of these things. He's really thinking about the specific African context in terms of the legacy of colonialism when he's looking at it from a Marxist lens. So it's not a kind of dogmatic application of a pre-established framework that he's just dogmatically applying. So so these are some of the things he's thinking about. Right on. Thank you. So you also in that piece talk about how working within a Marxist-Leninist framework, Babu theorized, quote, pan-Africanism as the most developed form of African nationalism, end quote. And talk about how Babu's definition of a nation here diverges from Stalin's, which was for many years the most dominant in the international communist context. You write, quote, if classical Marxist theorists in Europe maintained that capitalism in its developed phase creates its own grave diggers by creating an industrial proletariat, Babu argues that capitalism in its imperialist monopoly finance phase creates its own grave diggers by creating a common history of oppression that allows Africans and peoples of African descent to act as a collective historical subject that will play an essential role in bringing about imperialism's demise, end quote. So, yeah, very interesting. Would love to hear you expand on this a bit, you know, through Babu's work on the subject of Pan-Africanism as the highest form of African nationalism through this kind of engagement with Marxist-Leninist thinking. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, one way to think about this is to think about what Lenin's theory of imperialism did for the place of uh, national liberation struggles in a, in a Marxist worldview. Now, the famous uh, slogan is, you know, workers and oppressed peoples of the world unite. 
So you now have the oppressed peoples of the world and they're seen as being dominated by imperialism, dominated by the form of a capitalism that has come into being in the late 19th and early 20th century. So now their struggles against this for national liberation have come to be seen as progressive struggles that they're attacking different links in this chain of imperialism. Even bourgeois-led liberation struggles have come to be seen. Uh, again, this is sort of in the aftermath of, of Lenin's writing and its increased influence, of course, have come to be seen as progressive struggles. Now, and the idea here is not that progressive national liberation struggles led by uh, the bourgeoisie will bring into being a kind of utopia in these places, but they're now seen as, it's seen that breaking with imperialism is a necessary condition for creating a socialist society in places like Tanzania, Kenya, Egypt, whatever. But it's not sufficient, of course. There is an internal struggle that has to be fought for the restructuring of these societies. So again, it's not uh, that people who are making these promises of, well, just get rid of colonialism and everything will be fine. It's, it's uh, quite a bit more complicated than that. But the problem is, is okay, well, now we have, we have it so that nationalist struggles have an important role, but, well, what's a nationalist struggle? Of course, that's the question that's going to arise. So people turn to the question of, well, what's a nation in the first place? So Stalin's definition of a nation is as follows, and you'll see how, how it's limited, especially from an African perspective, and how it's kind of influenced by a Central and Eastern European historical context. So Stalin defines the nation as a historically evolved, stable community of language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in a community of culture. Now, this definition would seem to apply to a lot of Minorities, for example, in the Habsburg Empire, later the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as it came to be known. But it's not clear that this would apply in the African context, especially given the existence of a pan-African movement, which was developing from the 19th century, actually. So now it's significant to note that Stalin thought that the non-existence of any of the single features I mentioned was really a sufficient reason for not deeming a given community of people as a nation. Now, it's clear that if you take any of the, uh, take one of the aforementioned elements that we just talked about, so let's say, for example, we talk about stable community of language. How does that apply to somebody who's thinking about pan-Africanism? Well, it's clear that Africans and members of the African diaspora are not united by stable community of language, nor could we say that they have historically shared the same form of economic life. And Babu, actually, despite being a pan-Africanist, doesn't believe that there is anything like a single African culture. So what's the basis for pan-African nationalism as the highest and most developed form of African nationalism, according to Babo? Well, it's just the common history of oppression and its modern manifestations and common struggles against them. This is really the foundation for his thinking about pan-Africanism. So in Babo's account, Pan-Africanism is really a nationalist movement that responds to the deprivations of racialized capitalism, just capitalism as it exists in uh, the imperialist stage of its development. And that's how he's thinking about it. Also, Babo's work on Pan-Africanism is quite interesting because he makes a distinction between cultural Pan-Africanism and political Pan-Africanism. I mean, he's not very explicit about which one he favors, but I think for me it's clear that he favors political pan-Africanism. So cultural pan-Africanism would be a pan-Africanism that emphasizes cultural continuities between different societies on the African continent and different societies in the African diaspora and the Western Hemisphere and so on. Political pan-Africanism has to do with the project of actually building a federated state on the African continent and so on. And he, he, he tries to think about why these different forms of pan-Africanism have different levels of popularity across the world. So he thinks that the cultural form of pan-Africanism is really more common in the diaspora, whereas on the African continent, the political tendency is more common. And he's trying to connect this to facts about demography, so the fact that Africans are often a minority, african descendant people and Africans are often a minority in different societies in the so-called New World, whereas, of course, on the African continent, they're clearly the majority, so the political project there is a bit different. Yeah, I, I don't run too much about this, so I, I think I'll leave it here, but this is sort of uh, an overview of Babu's contributions to developing a synthesis between Pan-Africanism and Marxist-Leninism. 
Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. So shifting gears here a little bit, and the other piece of yours that we're talking about today, uh, questions from the Dar es Salaam debates you write about, as the title suggests, as a debate at the University of Dar es Salaam, a side of progressive politics, as you wrote, and these public debates during the 1970s and 1980s sought to answer prominent questions such as, and I'm quoting here, what is the nature of the ruling class in the neo-colonies? What is the relationship between the attempt to build socialism and the national questions given the reality of imperialism? And three, what is the relationship between the base and the superstructure? And is there anything specific about this relationship under the conditions of domination by foreign capital? And four, what is the nature of neocolonialism and how can they be combated? End quote. So let's just talk a little bit about these debates, the questions and answers that were generated and maybe discuss a bit about what your studies at the event made you want to write, want to write about this article. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's that's a very good question. I think I'll take the last bit of the question first. So in terms of the motivation, well, I was reading these uh, debates and I thought that, well, a lot of the questions that Josh had just raised are being raised today. And I thought, well, this could be a useful source for thinking about contemporary questions. And it doesn't mean that we're going to go there and find the answers for uh, these questions kind of pre-made for us. But it will also help us avoid reinventing the wheel. It's good to develop an intellectual history of these questions in different parts of the world, I think. Especially because if you think about just a bit of sociology of knowledge, there has been a massive discontinuity and kind of compromised institutional memories. So, for example, some of the journals I talked about earlier were discontinued in the 90s. So when we try to approach these questions today, I think it's it's important to look at what our uh, predecessors, if we can use this term, thought about them and the arguments they presented and whether they were good arguments or bad arguments and so on. So, so that's sort of my motivation for revisiting these debates. But really the key question, which I think, again, is, is still very much a live question, is what should be the attitude of Marxists towards non-Marxist liberation movements? That's really the question that people like Nabudari, Babu, and uh, Isa Shavji, who was also involved in the debates, Mahmoud Mamdani, and both uh, Shivji and, and Mamdani are still active today as academics, and so on. So that was the question that they were really posing, which is, what should be the attitude of East African Marxists towards TANO, the Tanganyika African National Union? So it's clearly not a Marxist party that's in power, but seems to be a progressive party of sorts. So the question was, how could we make it even more progressive? And how could we fight its sort of more right-wing tendencies? Which, of course, in any in any of these national liberation parties, which often really had the structure of France, you know, they had very, they had tremendous ideological diversity. There might be a wing which dominated the other wings of the parties, but really it was quite diverse. So there was an internal struggle within these parties with respect to who's going to dictate the general line that they're going to follow. So some of the questions that were raised were, well, now that Tan was in power, is it the case that this governing class is now a bureaucratic class? And so we can use a kind of Marxist framework for understanding how they're going to behave, how they perceive their interests and and, uh, the relationship, especially with foreign capital and so on. But of course, the the problem that emerged was, well, it's not clear that they control the means of production, uh, these people in government. So how can we speak of them as a class? So some people raised the question of, well, uh, perhaps through nationalization, this group can come to control the means of production, because now they will be, of course, in direct control of these pre-existing factories and and so on, which again, there weren't a lot of them, frankly, in, in, in the aftermath of independence. But what's interesting is this debate about nationalization, which really also became very important after the Arusha Declaration of, I think it was 1967, if I remember correctly, which declared nationalization of of a significant portion of businesses and industries in uh, Tanzania. This led to a debate about the relationship between nationalization and the project of creating a socialist economy. So... If nationalization could be seen as a means uh, for this governing group to become a class as a word, to control the means of production, to become a ruling class, well, it seems to reveal that nationalization, even though it's, it could be in a specific context, a necessary condition for socialism, it's obviously not sufficient because it could also be 
a necessary condition for the transformation of this governing group into bureaucratic class in the strict Marxist sense. This was the line that was taken by Isa uh, Shibji, for example. But then another question arose, well, what if these nationalizations were a kind of facade and really it's the case that foreign capital is still dominant in these economies? Now, if that's the case, and we can say, well, foreign capital is dominant in the sense that it controls the means of production, then it, we seem to have a problem here because then that would entail that the ruling class, assuming that the ruling class is the class that controls the means of production, is comprised of a group of people who don't even live in this state and who aren't part of this society. But if we think about it this way, then how can we lead class struggle against them? So again, there was this question of who is the immediate enemy. That was sort of the, the frame that they used. Was it people associated with the ruling party in Tanzania or was it foreign capital? And if it's foreign capital, well, how exactly are we supposed to fight it? And if it's foreign capital, is it a good idea for us to ally with some of the more progressive factions associated with Tano? So these are, I think, some of the questions and some of the answers that they generated, which led to more questions, of course, you know, as I've been trying to show. For sure, definitely. So what are some of the key differences between African socialism and, and Marxism? You write that, and I'm quoting here, uh, the proponents of African socialism in Tanzania held that the situation there was exceptional relative to developments across the African continent, insofar as communal forms had survived until the end of the colonial period, on the basis that the claim was made that such communal forms could provide an alternative basis for building a social society without the need for going through a stage of independent capitalist development. This view might have appeared especially plausible when its proponents contrasted the case of Tanzania with the case of neighboring Kenya, where a fairly strong case of British peasants is able to hire the labor powers of others emerged in the colonial period, end quote. So at the gaining independence, Tanzania, as, as you know, struggled to attract foreign investment to develop its productive forces due to various factors, including underdevelopment of infrastructure and industrial sectors. So talk a little bit about Nair's conceptualization of African socialism and the pitfalls and contradictions that arose, particularly as a response to the Tanzanian government attempting to maintain an independent foreign policy. Perhaps you can also do, do this, bringing in a bit of what you discuss in the other piece we were referencing earlier, where you talk about Babu and, and Nabidari's the criticism of Nairi's approach with specifically Badu, um, Babu uh, criticizing Nairi's approach to uh, as a form of African Narodinism, I, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, following along the lines of Lenin's criticism of uh, the Narodniks. Is that how you pronounce it? I will hopefully no, pronounce Narod, it. Narodniks. Narodniks. Okay, my bad. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, here is, here is kind of the simplified version of uh, Nyerere's theoretical approach when it comes to African socialism. So, one way to think about it is Nyerere wants to say something like the following. He wants to say, look, Africans, I mean, he's talking about Tanzanians, but then he tends to speak about Africans in general. That, that, that's also another issue, of course, we can talk about. But he says, look, you know, Africans already live in a kind of socialist society where uh, property is held in common and where there is no tendency towards accumulation that would create massive inequalities. So if you follow that line of thought, well, it seems that there are no classes. Now, of course, Marxism as a theory of social transformation emphasizes, among other things, the importance of class struggle for achieving structural social transformations. But if you're saying you don't have classes, then of course, that puts class struggle off the agenda, because how could there be class struggle without classes? That doesn't make any sense. Now, the question became, is this, you know, there is an empirical question, which is, is this a good description of the existing situation in Tanzania? And for people like Nabuderi and Babu, it wasn't clear to them that Nyerere ha had this right. Actually, it was clear to them that there were classes forming in Tanzania, even in the countryside, that there was also a process of accumulation by rich peasants who were labeled as kulaks. Of course, there's this Russian legacy, which, which, which was continuing into the 1970s and so on. So now if there were rich peasants and peasants who were either very poor or even about to be dispossessed of their land and just work as farmhands, hiring their labor, either to be paid in cash or in kind, then that means that really 
not only are there classes, but there is acute social stratification in the countryside. So a, a theory of social transformation and of development that's assuming that there are no classes in the countryside is really just wrong-headed. And Babu accused proponents of African socialism of having a very naive view of African history because Babu emphasized, he said, well, look, yeah, there might be some societies where some communal forms of uh, holding property in the village have survived. But he said, look, you also have to understand that historically speaking in different parts of the African continent, even in parts of East Africa with the kingdom of Bugunda, for example, there was tremendous social stratification There were empires, there were kingdoms which dominated these communal forms and siphoned surplus, agricultural surplus from these communal forms. So that in some places there were, even before colonialism, way before colonialism, there was a kind of tributary structure which got kind of articulated with a capitalist economic structure in the aftermath of colonialism and in some parts of the continent even before that. So that it's really quite more complicated the social reality of of the African continent is way more diverse and complicated than proponents of African socialism are making it seem. And that actually the social reality is best described through the lens of Marxism and that there is no point really attempting to develop a specifically African theory of socialism that discounts class struggle. Because for Babu, a specifically African, and for Nabuderi as well, a specifically African theory of building socialism must at least, at the bare minimum, start from the existing social realities and analyze those and build models for analyzing uh, these realities. And in this case, it would have to build a model for describing social stratification and different possible alliances and so on. So this also really mirrors Lenin's critique of the Narodniks, who, who also had this very romantic view of Russian history, and they had thought that actually capitalism had not restructured the Russian countryside and that there is the possibility of building socialism directly, as it were, on the basis of these villages where property was being held in common. And Lenin's response was to engage in a very thorough study of the development of capitalism in Russia, which attempted to show that actually Russia is already a capitalist economy. It doesn't have, you know, uh, it's it's not the case that's primarily a semi-feudal economy or anything like that. Uh, And you can think of Babu and Nabuderi as doing something similar for the African context where they're showing, well, Tanzania is already integrated into this world capitalist system. And if we don't start from this fact, we're going to end up confusing ourselves. I mean, this mirrors a debate that was also being held in Latin America with people debating whether uh, Latin American societies are semi-feudal or not. And Andre Gunder Frank, for example, was arguing that actually Some of these features, which people think of as atavistic, as a holdover from feudal past, are really quite modern. They're they're just the way that capitalism manifested itself in Latin America and so on. So, again, very similar debates were happening in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, So there is a kind of convergence here, if you will. Absolutely. So one of the first debates you highlight, you know, also one of my personal favorites to read in the text What's the specification of the nature of the ruling class and the neo-colonies, which is important for understanding who the primary enemy is? This was a point of emphasis because of the Marxian criterion of class. You write that, and I'm quoting here, if it is true that the economies of states like Tanzania were dominated by foreign monopoly capital, and this is a minimal commitment for any Marxist version of the theory of imperialism, then period in the question, then it follows that there was a complicated problem in identifying the ruling class in the neo-colony. For the ruling class of a given society is comprised by the wealthiest members of that society, then by definition, this ruling class will be comprised by a group of people living in or belonging to that society. However, if the ruling class of a given society is comprised of the people who control the means of production of that society, then that group of people may or may not be members of that society in the sense of living in that society, which what this implies is that the ruling class of a given society might not be part of that society. In fact, if African states in the post-independence period of the 1960s to 1980s were neo-colonies in the sense that their economic and political trajectory were controlled by the forces that were external to those states, then the ruling classes in those states did not exist, and that this common spatial-temporal sense of the term within those states, end quote. 
And another aspect of this debate is that there are two distinct segments of the national bourgeoisie and the neocolony. The first segment is the the small one, which generates and accumulates capital without recourse to finance capital. And the second segment is the big bourgeoisie, whose capital is part of imperialist finance capital. And you conclude that, and, and I'm quoting here again, the debate was really about the line in which the Marxists in Tanzania should take towards Nairus, T-A-N-U, as in should they enter an alliance with at least in the struggles against imperialism, or should they denounce it as a principal enemy, end quote. So I would just love for you to discuss the different contending positions of this debate, the implications and the conclusions it was brought to, if any. Yeah, so there were two main camps in the debate. So there was Nabuderi and people who were supporting him. And Nabuderi's contention was basically that actually the, the bourgeoisie, which for him was just a kind of petty bourgeoisie, there was for him no national bourgeoisie in most African countries, is not the primary enemy. They were the governing class, but they only had a managerial role. So if they're not the primary enemy, and even though they're subordinate for the most part to foreign capital, they also, there might be a situation where they might feel that they're being oppressed by this foreign capital in the sense that the division of profits is unfair given their managerial role and so on. So there might be some tension between them and foreign capitalists. In opposition to that, you had people like Ma- Mahmoud Mamdani and Isa Chivji who were saying, well, actually, what Nabudar is calling a governing class is a bureaucratic class, like we were talking earlier, and that they have come to control the means of production and the aftermath of nationalization. So it's those people who are the primary enemies. And it's this strategy that makes the most sense as a political strategy as well, because, you know, you can mobilize workers and peasants to struggle against this class, which exists in their country. But it's not clear if you take foreign capitalists as your primary enemy, how you're going to mobilize against them. How do you wage a class struggle, you know, across in a kind of intercontinental way, if you like, right? It's it's, it's quite a bit difficult to see that. But I want to go back also because there seems to be a tension here because uh, Shevji is saying, well, it's the case that this governing class is now a bureaucratic class because they control the means of production. But at the same time, he also seems to be saying, well, foreign capital is dominating the economy and it's that it's foreign capitalists who control the means of production. And you can see the contradiction here because if it's foreign capitalists who control the means of production, then they are the ruling class. So there, there is a problem here in terms of how class is being defined. And there is a problem in terms of how the liberation strategy based on this definition and this analysis is being framed. So let me go back to Nabuderi's position. I mean, I think Nabuderi arrives at perhaps unpalatable conclusions to many people, but I think his line of reasoning is very clear and persuasive even to a degree. So Nabuderi's position is as follows. And I'm going to kind of lay it in a standard, what philosophers call a standard form of an argument, just because I, I, I like doing that. I think it makes it clearer. So his basic argument is based on two premises. So he wants to say the first premise is we're in this era of imperialism. And that means, if it means anything, it means that the means of production in at least some of the new colonies, including, including Tanzania, which he's focused on, and Uganda, where he's from, the means of production in these places are owned for the most part by foreign capital and its bearers, so uh, the ruling class in the imperialist countries. And the second premise is the group that owns most of the means of production in a given society is the ruling class of that society, even if it's not the governing class. So it doesn't hold political office. Could be the case, you know, they're, they're not holding political office. And the conclusion that's derived from these two premises is that in the era of imperialism, the ruling class in at least some of the new colonies, including Tanzania and Uganda, is the ruling class of the imperialist countries. So they coincide. Now, this argument, of course, can be challenged by, you could challenge at the conceptual level, you could challenge the second premise. You should say, you could say, well, actually, we're just thinking incorrectly about the ruling class, but then you'd have to offer a different definition. Or you could challenge it on empirical grounds and say, well, actually, it's not the case that the means of production are owned for the most part by foreign capital in these countries. So this is just framing the way you could challenge it. Now, given Nabudari's argument, his answer to the question of who is the immediate enemy will be, well, look, it's not the national governing class or the uh, governing group, if you will. 
And if there is indeed nothing like a national bourgeoisie in the sense that there is nothing like a group of people in that society who primarily accumulate through owning the means of production without having a subordinate role vis-a-vis foreign capital. And if exploitation is primarily carried out by foreign capital, then it would be a strategic mistake to identify the principal enemy as an internal enemy. So let's say the political governing class or the people who are holding office. So for both Nabudari and uh, Yash Tandon, who took his side in these debates, it's not feasible to think of any democratic national revolution, which didn't bring a significant portion of the petty bourgeoisie to the side of the workers and peasants. So it's really a debate about whether you need a portion of the petty bourgeoisie to be on your side. So the petty bourgeoisie are people who, they primarily hold service and professional positions. You know, they're managers, they're engineers, petty is small, small traders, uh, things like that. And of course, it's interesting that almost all the leaders of African national liberation struggles were petty bourgeoisie. They were like school teachers, like Nyerere himself, agricultural engineers, for example, like Amilcar Cabral. Fanon, for example, who of course played an important role in the Algerian revolution, was himself a psychiatrist. So again, they were kind of middle class professionals, if you, if you want to use that label. But sorry, to, to get back to what I wanted to say here. So it's really a debate about whether you're going to include a segment of these people or you're going to exclude them and try to say, well, actually, the revolution should just be led by Marxist Leninist intellectuals, workers, and peasants. So that's really what's being debated. And uh, these were some of the answers that were uh, provided by the two camps, the two main camps in the debate. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So we have talked about this quite a bit on here as of late, but I'm always curious about the debates about development. In this case, I'm referencing this section in the article surrounding the relationship between peasants and workers. There were participants in the Dar es Salaam debates, such as Nabidari, who believed the United Front must be led by the working class. But you make note of the problem with that, where you write, and I'm quoting here, because of the narrow industrial base, which was inherited from the colonial period, there were not that many workers in Tanzania. In I-61, for example, there were only 411,538 uh, wage earners in Tanzania, so the vast majority of whom were not employed in, in industry, which was practically non-existent. To this extent, the significance of the working class in Tanzania was derived more from the strategic location that it occupied than the sheer numbers of its members. The, their ability to carry out strikes that could paralyze the economic life of the country, despite their small numbers, was on full display during the 1950s when they engaged in a series of strikes in support of the independence movement. End quote. So you also write how the peasantry outnumbered the workers. However, they were seen as a great physical force and not as a great revolutionary force per se. Uh, Emil Cabral echoed this sentiment as well. But I would just love for you to discuss the importance of this distinction. Yeah, so I mean, this this was a really important debate in this context because it was clear to everybody that you need to mobilize the peasantry if you want something to happen. But the question was whether the peasantry, if you will, left to its own kind of inertial trajectory, if we can uh, speak like this, had the tendency towards revolution whether it's a revolutionary class, because it could be the case that it's not a revolutionary class, but it's a necessary class for for a revolution. You have to have it on your side. And what many people in the debates pointed out was they had, and this is very much a kind of classical Marxist view, they had that workers due to, you know, their geographical placement in urban centers, their close contact with each other in a way that's not the case in the countryside where people are, of course, much more dispersed they're able to act more effectively as a unified force. They understand how to use modern communication technology. They have some understanding of the position of their country vis-a-vis the rest of the world. You know, I can think of dock workers, you know, news gets passed around in port areas. There is a lot of work on that. So there was this idea that this was a class that was more more in tune with what's happening on the ground, both in these urban centers, but also the connections between these urban centers and other parts of the world. So that the workers basically could take advantage of the conditions they're placed in, the, the heavy concentration of workers in port areas, uh, along railway lines, and so on, to act in a way that would ensure that their action has, has a significant impact on that society. So, of course, strikes would be one obvious way to do this, especially if we're talking about workers who work 
in the logistical infrastructure of a given country, you can imagine when they strike, even if they're not a significant portion of the population, they can bring everything to a halt. Now, the idea here was that if you look at the peasantry by contrast, of course, they're more widely dispersed. And a peasantry, in terms of the way that this term was being used in this context, also meant people who owned their land or weren't at least wage workers on someone else's land, even if they were, of course, producing for the market. And even if they were dependent on the market for subsistence, because they needed to buy certain commodities to survive. So they were no longer self-sufficient. But there was still this ideal of self-sufficient peasants. So even the idea here was that even when the peasantry rebels, what they want is more security in terms of their private possessions. And again, note here that both Babu and Nabudari thought that it's not the case that land was being held in common. Maybe it was being held in common nominally, but in effect, there was already private property. So their orientation tends to be concerned with questions of, for example, the prices that they get for their commodities. So that they're still really thinking about social action and from the perspective of small commodity producers, as opposed to workers who don't own the means of production, who understand, according to this kind of classical view, that to improve their situation, they will have to overturn that society. Although, of course, you know, one could respond here and say, well, look, if you look at the history of unions, while well, some unions have taken this more ameliorative approach, asking for better wages giving up on a project of social transformation. But people like B- uh, Babu and Nabudari would say, well, look, I mean, this is just because it's not the case that you just rely on workers' instinct to develop along these socialist lines. You have to have party work. I mean, this is why they were Marxist Leninists who believed in some kind of vanguardist approach to political activity. So this was really what they were talking about. And I mean, it's very interesting that uh, I want to go back to the Cabral quote. I mean, Cabral held that that, yeah, of course, the peasantry was an important physical force. And without them, the PIGC in Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde couldn't uh, have accomplished anything. But he thought, based on his experience and the experience of the PIGC, that the peasantry doesn't really have a tendency to ask for complete social transformation. What they usually want is, even when they rebel against their traditional roles, it's because their traditional roles are no longer tenable. They want to bring a state of affairs that would take them back in time, as it were, to a time when it was tenable. So it's very much a kind of backward-looking conception of political transformation, a backward-looking goal, if you like. So these are some of the, the questions that were being raised in relation to this question of the peasantry and the workers. Right on. Thank you. Absolutely. So in that same section, um, Fanon's formulation of the wretched of the earth, that the peasantry is, is a revolutionary force or class, was also criticized at these debates, and, and specifically in, in, in the realm of him being completely, I think there was a quote where yeah, it says that Fanon is completely confused on these issues. Unlike Lenin, he had never really grasped of the scientific theory, nor the experience in the working class struggle. His was essentially a very radical, pretty bourgeois populist, <laughs> end quote. Uh, I thought that was a pretty ruthless quote. And Jay and I spoke about this quite extensively, but, and, and obviously, me personally, right, I disagree with the formulation itself, because I think Fanon, from what I've studied of him, uh, committed class suicide materially and materially assisted the revolutionary struggle as well. But I'm intrigued by the criticism. And, and I think the purpose of including this, I'm assuming, was to note this ideological and intellectual divergence between the participants at the Dar es Salaam debates and Fanon, because it is not fair. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm quoting here, by the way, what you said. But it's not fair to say that there have been attempts to depict Fanon essentially representing all that is interesting about African anti-colonial Marxism. An uncritical worship of Fanon in some circles, in our view, partially to be explained by referring to the fact that he is taken up as the sole representative of African anti-colonial Marxism. And this, in turn, is to be explained by the fact that there's, is, there's ignorance about the diversity of standpoints which were taken up by African Marxists in the aftermath of the struggle's national independence, end quote. So, yeah, I would just love for you to discuss um, and elaborate on this, particularly like what circles have have you noticed this in? And and also, I, I also like want to hear more about how you see Fanon is uh, is discussed because he never explicitly identifies a Marxist, but I do see it in some places he is considered a Marxist. But others, I think, I feel like his Marxism is incompletely erased, if anything, or you know. So even if he was cozy with it, of course, right? So yeah, if you can just discuss this a bit. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's yeah. You went you went straight to the most controversial part of the. <laughs> I just yeah. want to clarify. Yeah, yeah. I, and I mean, I'm not not that I'm uh, trying to cop out, but like the very salty quote about Fanon is actually from Isa Shevji, not from me. Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think with Fanon, I think it's it's interesting because I do think that in in people who are trying to think about political theory and political philosophy, if you will, from the perspective of the global South. Fanon has come to be idolized, I think, in an unhealthy way. Where I mean, I've been in, in conferences where you can't say anything critical about Fanon, but I think part of the problem is really he's taken to be almost the sole representative of an attempt to make Marxism fit to African realities. And again, as you know, Josh, he never says that he's a Marxist. That's absolutely correct. I totally agree with that. But I think with many intellectual historians and many people who work on this from the perspective of Africana philosophy, uh, broadly speaking, which is my area, or that's where I'm coming from, Fano is taken as kind of the sort of representative. And I think when that happens, people become hesitant to criticize, criticize Fano or to think critically about what the things he's saying, because you've, you know, when you do that, you've overlaid it with, well, this is the only representative of this attempt to make Marxism accord with African realities. So you'll be charged with, you know, Eurocentrism or something. But but of course, my point here is to say that there was quite a diverse group of people who were attempting to make Marxism useful to national liberation struggles, people like Nabudere Babu, and that some of them, I think, had good reasons for being critical of Fanon's characterization of the peasantry. And for, for a very simple reason, I mean, if you take what Fanon says, so so he says, for example, it's and this is a quote from him, that in colonial countries, only the peasantry is revolutionary. It has nothing to lose and everything to gain. Now, the problem with this view is, let's just take, for example, the Algerian case. The resistance of the peasants and the revolts, so there were, of course, always peasant revolts during the French occupation of Algeria and attacks on colonists, on French colonists, because, of course, Algeria was a settler colony. And Fanon was aware of this. But all of these revolts and attacks on colonists, they didn't lead to a general revolutionary war until the peasants were mobilized by leadership coming from the urban areas. So I think that's something that Fanon seems to have missed. I don't know if he did that for what he thought were tactical reasons, for example. But the question of understanding, I think, what somebody like Eric Wolf, for example, called the peasant wars of the 20th century. So he was looking at Mexico in the early 20th century, uh, Vietnam, of course, Algeria. The problem of understanding the relationship between the peasantry and the conditions that led the peasantry to not only just revolt against their own exploitation, but to attempt to participate in this general project to restructure society. I think that's very important because in many cases, you will see that there was it was also in part the influence of intellectuals from urban centers. I mean, Amilcar Cabral, who we talked about earlier a bit, is a great example of this. Or people who were already kind of immersed in this milieu of workers' activism in urban centers. Which is not to say that, of course, the peasantry didn't play an important role. It played the decisive role in these revolutionary wars. But the question is, under what conditions did it go from just revolting and kind of engaging in acts of resistance to participating in a project of social transformation? And I think here, I think some of the criticisms of Fanon are reasonable and one could, you know, think about them in, in quite a serious way. Does that go a bit towards answering your question? I thought it was a really uh, important question. Yes, it does. I appreciate that. Thank you for the breakdown. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, thank you for for all this discussion today. Is there are there any points that you know you kind of wanted to bring up or touch on in these two essays that we kind of neglected to offer space for you to reflect on here? No, I, I mean I think the questions were were quite comprehensive. I mean the only thing I'd say, and this is maybe something I just care more about because of my own research, which is a kind of methodological element given debates about, you know, whether Marxism is Eurocentric or not. And I think one of the things I've been trying to do in these two essays is to say, look, there is a standard approach, which is to go like dig for whatever, you know, sliver of text we can find about, you know, Marx talking about some place in North Africa or East Africa and kind of build a theory around that. 
which I think is, is not really the best way to do it. Or we can actually look at the reception of Marxism in, on the African continent in different parts of the African continent during the 20th century and see how people made use of it. And then try to then approach this question of Eurocentrism from that perspective as opposed to having a very insular standpoint. And I mean, I think this is something worth saying, given I think a lot of debates today are about, you know, what is and what isn't Eurocentric and so on. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, no, I appreciate that a lot. I mean, it's something certainly that we've tried to push back on throughout kind of the history of this podcast. You know, obviously we touched on it too, like last year when we talked about Walter Rodney's, the, you know, the release of essays that is decolonial Marxism, which is a set of Walter Rodney's essays in which he specifically addresses that question as well. And I think we also generally agree with you that the best way to respond to that question is not to look to European Marxists or Marx himself, you know, and say, you know, in what ways are they or are they not Eurocentric as individuals? It's to say, okay, you know, Marxism is is a methodology. It's, you know, some people would argue it's a science, right? It's it's a, you know, it's a set of, certainly a set of tools that are picked up and used around the globe. And, you know, how were those tools used in different places? And, you know, what were the analyses of the people who used them within their own context? I think we find more interesting, at least, <laughs> than trying to figure out, you know, was Marx really a racist or whatever people want to want to do this week, you know, in that in that regard. Yeah, yeah. actually, I, I just want to just a brief follow up because you mentioned Walter Rodney and actually Walter Rodney was at Dar es Salaam University as well. So, I mean, he was he was around these debates. I mean, but of course, he was more cautious in terms of the sorts of criticisms that he would level at the ruling party because he understood his place as a kind of a guest and so on. But Babu, you know, wrote a postscript for how Europe underdeveloped Africa, actually. And some of the people who were involved in these debates were were quite close to Walter Rodney. So that's just something I wanted to mention because we, we didn't have a chance to talk about Walter Rodney in, uh, in this episode. Yeah. And in, it's interesting. I mean, in some respects, too, I mean, one of the things I appreciate about your work here and this this project, too, is that, I mean, Fanon, as you said, is someone who, I mean, I agree with Josh, it's complicated because there are plenty of people who would say also, you know, Fanon had nothing to do with Marxism or, you know, Fanon is not a Marxist. But I do think that there is an overrepresentation of his thought as kind of, like you say, like a you know, all that is important about African anti-colonial philosophy or or whatever. And it's interesting because I think both with Rodney and with Fanon, you know, you're talking about people who come out of the Caribbean. And it, it's, you know, it's interesting in some respects that they then stand in for Africans who actually, you know, develop a kind of Marxist or Marxist-Leninist point of view. And it's not to say... I absolutely agree with Josh in terms of discussion of of class suicide and seeking to be in solidarity and and working in support of of liberation movements and being on the continent and materially you know producing work for those movements as well. But I think that is an interesting context as well that you have folks that actually come from you know uh, so Guyana and. Martinique, right? Uh, Guyana and Martinique that that end up becoming the the representatives there. Mm -hmm. No, I think that like uh, in Jay, Jay, you and I talked about this, but my thing when I was reading it, the article itself, I was struggling with the point. It's not even a point because like, I actually thought it was like kind of funny, right? The critique itself, the critique about you know saying him being a petty bourgeois pop populist. I thought it was like that way that it was worthy. It was really hilarious, but like but even beyond that i think because i think it, there was a lack of specification from you that and it felt like it was like so i was like okay so which circles are particularly where this is happening and then so i was talking speaking about this with jay and i was like but like in, in the u.s context right that's the context i can mostly speak to right like i feel like a, a lot of his overrepresentation it coincides with the kind of sanitization as well Right. And I feel like a lot of people and I talk about this all the time. Like I feel like a lot of people like stop reading for no after black skin, white mask. Right. And so I feel like and and that's in, in my opinion, like some of his like least revolutionary work, I guess you can say. 
right? And so, and, and I feel like that's like the over, I feel like if anything, that is what has become over represent, represented over, over, you know, but like, it, it, and that kind of constitutes a kind of anti-colonial, like, you know, not even Marxism, but I think it becomes a kind of anti-colonial, you know, a representative of anti-colonial thought in general, I think. And I think the way that it's been, so in my opinion, it's like, it's something, it's something similar to how I see a lot of people talk about like, Martin Luther King Jr. or something like or something like that, and it's like, yeah, like they're dominantly, you know, what I'm saying they dominate discussions about civil rights movement, or you know, what I'm saying, or but it's like that that also coincides with the continual sensitization and whitewashing of their thought in general, and also the, the, the radicalization of their thought in general, and so yeah, and so I was like, so I was just curious about specifying what actual spaces this problem exists in. And how we can, you know, rectify that. Because I do think it is important to kind of like, like you do, you're doing this piece, like bringing other thinkers from these formulations, right? From anti colonial Marxism into the forefront and trying to, like, you know, what I'm saying there's others you can study as well in that context. And so I appreciate that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that that's a really important point, Josh, because. Yeah. I, I mean, you're right. I, th- I think in retrospect, I would have specified, you know, the groups I'm targeting uh, more explicitly, but you know, with academic writing, sometimes you also have to be a bit sly as it were. Uh, mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but no, but but also the other point is actually, I mean, I agree with you that there is also the sanitization of Kanal to turn him into a phenomenologist, you know, like somebody who just does a kind of phenomenology of racial being, right? In, in uh, black skin, white mask, for example, where then his engagement with you know, uh, questions of political economy is sort of bracketed. People don't look at the other texts, uh, like a dying colonialism, wretched of the earth, and so on. So, so I agree, and I think the way that people sometimes even frame this is that actually, you know, they do a kind of sleight of hand in the sense that Ofano oh, represents a kind of stretching of Marxism to suit conditions in the global south, and stretching Marxism entails basically getting rid of it, right? So it's, uh, and then they give you this kind of phenomenologically oriented Fano, who have uh, been, as you pointed out, sanitized from his interaction with historical materialism as a framework of social analysis. So yeah, I mean, I do think we kind of agree on this point. Definitely, definitely. Right on. Yeah, thank you. And I was I'm, I appreciate that, that discussion as well. So again, like, thank you so much for coming on. To close, we just want to give you space, you know, to share places. I mean, you can note where these essays will be um, available and, you know, just where folks can find your work, connect with you and, you know, anything else, if there's other projects you're a part of, you want to shout out or anything. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, in terms of the availability of these essays, so they're in edited volumes and those tend to be pretty expensive. So I usually just post them on my uh, academia page or my Phil Papers page. So people just Google my name and fill papers, they'll find my profile and I'll have PDFs there that are accessible because, yeah, we, we don't make any money off these books, so uh, I don't really have uh, much of an interest in, in, in withholding this material. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, hosting and thank you for the fantastic questions. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks. Same. Yep. Yeah, thank you.